Hello, welcome everybody at home uh, hanging out with us tonight on this fine Wednesday. Um, welcome Resonate Church members and also just friends and family and uh, share this video. Um, let's get the word out. Let's get worship out. We're super excited for you to be with us here tonight. Are you ready to worship in your homes? Yes. We're ready. Lord, we just thank you for your presence. Thank you that it... Um, <sighs> You are enough tonight. Whatever need we have is found in you. And I, I just thank you that um, as we worship you, you inhabit our praises. We get to abide in your presence right now, Lord. I pray for your peace to come into our homes. We welcome your peace right now. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we welcome you tonight. How quickly we forget the God who lives in every day. How easy to lose sight that you reside in the mundane. How quickly we forget the power that's running through our veins. The kind of power that empties rains. And oh, His power can still reign. 
we thank you that you're always moving. Father, we actively stay in a state of faith, believing your word, believing your promises. Father, we don't live by our feelings. We don't live by sight. We live by faith in you and your word. You always come through. We release control. You are Lord. I found you in the middle of my mess And you had been there all along When I found that I had never no been hard That's a remix You didn't hesitate at all <laughs> And the lies I they crumble with the weight of your truth and the fear
Tell the Lord he is worthy. Just welcome the Lord into your presence right now. Just get quiet right into your room. want to encourage you church those watching to set up times in your home just like this where you just praise and get quiet do it with your family do it by yourself even if you just have five minutes you can sit on your couch and you can just sing you don't even need music you don't need words or maybe you just get quiet what an opportunity we have when we stop ourselves and we put the Lord in a place of honor he meets us there that's when we can experience his presence. We don't just sing to the Lord. We're actually communing with him through this time of worship. You give life. You give life. And you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. And you restore. You give life, you are 
just one more time together. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath, Lord, in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you, Holy. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Um, go ahead and uh, get comfortable and get yourself a little beverage or whatever, and we're going to get started with the awesome teaching from Pastor Paul. On the Sunday of Easter, my Savior gave to me a neighbor sitting in church with me. <laughs> whoa, 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 hey, hi. We are going around the neighborhood singing Easter carols to invite people like you to join people like us for Easter Sunday morning services. Yep, and Dave here thought it was a good idea for us to dress as Easter characters. It was a committee decision. Anywho, this Easter we have some of your favorite memorable characters, like the guard at the tomb. Do that soldier thing. Surely this man was the son. Tell him who I am. Tell him. Seemed pretty self explanatory. Did it? Because your text read, and I quote, wear a pilot costume. I did not mean an airline pilot. I meant Pilate, the Roman governor who had a pivotal scene with Jesus when it came to the crucifixion. Would you like to come to Easter services with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm Pilate. Pilate, washing my hands. I will have nothing to do with this innocent man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Oh, and I am Malchus. I am a servant of the high priest Calliope. Nobody knows who Malchus is. Um, and I was in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter cut off my ear. <laughs> oh, we're losing him. Okay. Oh, 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 one, two, and a three. Just, Just sit right, right back, back into here here a hero tale, a tale of a sacrifice. sacrifice. He, he rode, rode into Jerusalem, and Peter denied him thrice. <laughs> oh, please join us for Easter. Well, that's quite an introduction. All right. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Awesome. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to a live feed. This is kind of fun. This is actually really cool. Actually, you know, we have this new technology. I actually see you right now. And uh, that cold beverage that Lauren told you to get, I won't tell anybody what it is. All right. So good deal. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad that you're with us today. You know, there's... At this time, you know, things going on, the coronavirus, things like this, obviously we know fear is out there. Fear is just going crazy. And so I want to talk to you today about fear. You know, we've all experienced fear. You have, I have. Uh, there's a lot of things in this world that can really give us fear, you know? Um, and so, I mean, just how about just even the economic crash that's happening right now in the stock market and things like this? And you know, you can look at that and go, hey, great opportunity to buy, or, you know, you can be looking at it and just going, look, all the money I lost. And perspective has a lot to do with it. And fear in general has a lot to do with perspective. And so today we're going to talk about that. Trust me, I've dealt with fear. I, you know, as a kid, I was full of fear. And, you know, is mom watching, Colleen? Okay, mom's not watching. She put fear in me like crazy, Okay. <laughs> Dad helped. All right. You know what I mean? Why? Because I was a crazy man. You know what I mean? It was just like, okay, we got to put some fear in him. Otherwise, he's going to kill himself. And so I felt like I was going to kill myself. Anyway, I had a lot of fear. But I learned that I had to conquer fear because fear kept growing in my life. And even as a little kid, I said, I'm going to conquer this fear. And I had to battle it my whole life. When I met Christ, that's when I truly got the victory over it. You know, when I was a little kid, I had a fear of heights and things like that. And, uh, you know, um, and so on a windy day, I climbed the tallest tree in our backyard and just hung on as the wind was blowing me back and forth and stuff like this. I think you guys need to come up front here. They won't mind you sitting down and, like, waving to them and stuff like that. <laughs> they just watched you on stage here just a second ago, you know what I mean? So it's not like, uh, you know, hey, who's those people walking in? Yeah, where'd they come from? Oh, the stage. Okay. Were you not paying attention during worship? All right, anyway. I wasn't. <laughs> Obviously you weren't. Yeah, you messed up a whole song. 
Anyway, so let's talk about fear. What is it? There's a law in interpretation, Bible study, um, and it's called the law of first mention. And so when you're studying the Bible and you're looking at any subject, the first place it's mentioned, you're going to find laws that carry through for that subject all through the Bible and all through life. And so you'll see this. And the first place that men, a fear is mentioned, can anybody guess? I will tell you. It's Genesis. Genesis 3, chapter 8. And it says this. And this is after Adam and Eve ate of the tree that they weren't supposed to eat of. Okay, and it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God among the, you know, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Then the Lord said, who told you you were naked? Another key point. So this is the first time we see fear mentioned. And what was it that caused the fear? You know, obviously they ate of the fruit, their eyes were open. It didn't mention that fear even entered into their life there. But you know what it was? They knew they were, they were naked, there was shame, there was this kind of stuff. But when God showed up, Fear entered in, and they tried to hide from God. How many of you know when God was asking, where are you? It might have been a, more of a rhetorical question than an actual question. You know what I mean? He's like finding out, where are you? You see, what happened is, is Adam and Eve moved from being close to God to being far away from God. You see, what was different? Was God different? No. Was Adam and Eve in their physical bodies different? You know what I mean? You look at that. What was different? Fear came in because they were now separated from God. Can I share this with you? And I believe this is true. The areas that you have fear in, there's an absence of God in that area of your life. It's not because God is absent, but he's crying out, where are you? I also like the thing, who told you you were naked? You see, Adam and Eve listened to information that was contrary to the word of God, to the direction of God. And when they did that, guess what happened? They reaped the results of not listening to God, which was fear in this case, right? Um, condemnation, they felt ashamed, they felt all these things. God had an answer for that instantly, and that's what I love about God. He always has an answer. And what did he do? He declared Jesus' birth right from that instance. He said, there's gonna be a seed of a woman and he's gonna crush your head and you're gonna bruise his heel. So right then, God declared Christ into the earth the answer for what just happened. I'm gonna talk more about that on Sunday. It's gonna be really good and you're gonna find out some really cool things about that. So fear entered in, why? Because they, there was an absence of God in their life now, in the garden, in their life. And so they had fear. God then gave them instructions on how not to have fear and, and those types of things. And so we'll look at some of that later if we get time. I want you to notice here that 1 John 4, 18, let's look at that. 1 John 4, 18 says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So what's God's antidote to fear? He said, perfect love cast out fear. So what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve started to fear? What was it that happened? They separated themselves from love. You know, God is the only one that can really do this, but he says, if you love me, you will obey everything that I say. Because he's the only one that's perfect. But do you know when you're in relationships and you love people, you, you know, you do things to make sure that, that that relationship stays alive. You do things for them. You do things even when it's inconvenient. You do things to make sure that that relationship stays connected and alive, right? right? Well, what they did is they did things to separate from God. They didn't believe him. They didn't trust him. God is saying perfect love will cast out fear. And so therefore, when we get born again, this is really cool. I'm not, I've, I've got a, a whole line of teaching that will take us to this point. But I think I'm just going to start just giving you some of the answers now because I want to get to another portion of scripture here kind of quickly. But it says there's no fear uh, in love, but perfect love cast out fear. What did God give us when he gave us the Holy Spirit? 
What's the fruit of the Spirit? Everybody at home, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Everybody run, two, three, ready? Love, peace, You know, you guys are doing better at home than the front row's doing for me. Okay, it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's no law. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. And when you walk in that, 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 that spirit-led life, there's nothing to judge, right? And so you think about that. And so now perfect love will cast out that fear. God gave us the Holy Spirit. Why did he give us the Holy Spirit? So that we wouldn't have fear. He doesn't want us to have fear anymore. You look at the life of Jesus and in his ministry, right? What happened when his ministry got started? Think about this. He's going along. He gets baptized you know, John's going, hey, you know what? I'm not worthy, you know, I, you know I, I'm not. And Jesus is going, listen, we need to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, righteousness was doing everything that was God's will. And so we got to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did the obedient thing. He did what was right. And when we do what's right, good things happen. And what he did is he went into the water. He did what was right. Did he need to repent of his sin? No. You know what I mean? Did he need to do anything? No, but he fulfilled all righteousness. It's a righteous action when you get baptized. It's righteous when we just obey God. And he did that. And then right from there, you know, from heaven, the voice comes and said, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. Come on, somebody. He gets his affirmation from heaven. And it says the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came and alighted upon him. And instantly the Spirit drove him to the desert to be tempted by the devil. You see, before, before his ministry could start, he had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that empowering Holy Spirit actually brought him to a place to face the greatest opposition, Satan himself. And he passed every temptation and you think about the temptation and how did he do it? He did it with, it is written. You see, it's important that we know what the word of God says. Why? Because Jesus got baptized because of the word. He fulfilled righteousness. He went into the desert following the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you to places so that you can be tested to prove that you're more than the devil is. He'll lead you to places to prove that you and him together are greater than the lack in your life. Come on. He will allow things into your life so that you can prove, come on, that the, you and the anointing and the word of God are more than enough to handle anything Satan throws at you. Amen. Yep. Man, that'll cast out fear right there, won't it? I've got God in me helping me. I've got the person of the Holy Spirit in me. You're the temple of God. That's huge. What kind of confidence does God have in you and me that he would allow us to be his temple? Think about that. He, didn't, he, didn't, he doesn't want his temple walking around getting defeated by the devil. Are you kidding me? The Bible says that when we see Satan, we're gonna look at him and go, this is the one that deceived the nations? This, this? This defeated thing deceived the whole nations. Do you get that? Deceived the whole nations. Let's go back to the garden law first mentioned. Who told you you were naked? Then he addressed the serpent because Eve kind of gave up, you know, hey, I listened to the serpent. And then do you think that that might be why God said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? Because Satan only has, he's a one-trick pony. He needs your mind. He needs your mind. <laughs> Lauren loved the one-trick pony thing. <laughs> yeah, it's an old saying. Yeah, older than you. So, yeah. <laughs> All us old people are going, yeah, yeah, of course, one trick pony. Anyway, so God is like setting us up for victory, and he's telling us how to avoid the garden experience. You know, every time we listen to Satan, don't we feel separated from God? Yes. You're not, but you feel that way. You're walking away from that closeness. You're walking away from that perfect love, and eventually that sin will cause fear. 
You know, you think about it. Everybody that's had an affair has a fear that their spouse will find out. Everybody who steals anything has a fear that they're going to get caught. Anybody who lies has a fear that they're, I mean, all these things, all these things, cheating, lying, whatever the sin may be, we could go down the Ten Commandments. We could go into all the law, you know what I mean, and look at all these things. And when we do those things, you know what it produces? It produces fear. Sunday, I'm going to promote Sunday again. I'm going to share with you some things that will release you from any of that so that you can live a victorious life all the time. In fact, on Sunday, why don't you do this? Why don't you, why don't you take some of your friends, you know what I mean? And you know, maybe your neighbors that don't go to church, why don't you invite them over? Invite them over and find out what the true gospel is about. Um, maybe you know some people, maybe you don't want to invite them into your house because you want to watch church in your jammies or something like that. You can give them the link to watch, you know, live with us. Tell them, you know, to get on the Facebook page and click on live and they can watch with us. You know, what a great chance. I mean, you know, you look at this, okay? Could this produce fear? in the church, in the body of Christ, you know, as pastors, I'm preaching to an empty room. Okay, this is, you know, you know there's four people on the front row. You know, it, it, it's like, there's churches that may close from this. Why? Because when people don't go to church for three weeks, they get out of the habit of it. And it gets very easy to never show up again. Unlike our church, because you guys are, you guys are phenomenal. You guys are disciples. You guys are, are, are amazing. I brag about you all the time. You give even when you're not here. We had people knocking on the door today to bring in their tithes. You know, I mean, oh my gosh. My, I, you know, as a pastor, I'm humbled and I'm grateful. Colleen are that way. So we, you know, it shouldn't, you know, I mean, you're that way. You know what I mean? Why? Because we're disciples of Christ. We love God. We love his church. We're doing all this. But you know, there will be churches that will close from this. That is sad. But I look at it, man. Satan, you're trying to close down not only our economy and our world, but churches. You know what? Uh -uh, we're going to grow. Amen. We're growing. Why? You know what you can do? You can be evangelistic. You can talk to people that don't come to church. They'll come to your house to watch church. Maybe next Wednesday, come to your house and watch church, whatever. Let's make a difference. Let's make, this, let's make the church bigger. You know what I mean? You know what, honestly, wow, how, how would it be like every Sunday we have church all over the place, you know what I mean? Not only here, but in homes all over the country. Man, what a deal, why? I think we have a good word that needs to be shared. It's about Jesus Christ, amen? And so instead of being in fear, what are we doing? We're in here broadcasting services to you live. You're home worshiping God, and you know, I can guarantee you, you sense the Holy Spirit in your home. That worship was awesome. You know what I mean? That we just did. You can, right now, the Holy Spirit's like talking to you about the word of God, about fear. In fact, we're gonna go to 2 Timothy. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go there. This wasn't part of my plan, but we're gonna, we're gonna go to 2 Timothy 1.7 and listen to this. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Look at that. You guys are killer, man. Yay for the tech team. Amen. Second Timothy 1 7. Look at that. Um, you know, we got up there. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And when you look at that, that word is the word pneuma. It means spirit. It's the same thing like your living spirit that God breathed into man as spirit pneuma. It's the same word that's used for Holy Spirit pneuma. So God did not give you a spirit that would produce fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Amen. You know, I'd have to look it up, but I think it's Acts 1.8. It says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Judea, Jerusalem, whatever it is. You know, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Do you realize them being a witness back in that time meant that they would be killed usually? Come on. They were getting persecuted not only by the Romans, but they were getting persecuted by the church, the Jews, the Jewish church that they were just now born out of. Man, they had to have courage. And God's saying, I'm going to give you my spirit, and my spirit is going to cause you to be courageous. Do you understand? We don't have to have fear because we have God. He's not far from us. As Adam and Eve got separated from God, they experienced fear. We got infused with God. 
You know, the Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a brand new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things passed away. What was it? The old you that was corrupted by that sin nature, that old you that was corrupted by separation from God, Come on, God says no more. When you get born again, I'm gonna change that. I'm not gonna have a church that's full of fear. I'm not gonna have a church that's powerless. I'm not gonna have a church that's wimps. I'm gonna have a church that's strong. So I'm gonna give my spirit to my church. Man, what if we just thought about that for a little bit? Every time that I, I have fear, it's an absence of God in that area. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, natural. I can't do this in my flesh, my will, my willpower, my mind. I can't win it in the flesh. And that's what that means, okay? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What's a stronghold? Anybody at home, what's a stronghold? There's a lot of answers happening right now. Stronghold is any thought that is so strong, contrary to God, that God can't get in. Can I share with you any area of fear is a stronghold that God isn't in? If you have 4,000 rolls of toilet paper, that's an irrational fear. (laughs) <laughs> be kind be kind <laughs> was I not nice <laughs> oh be kind yeah well, hey you know what you could be the hit party of the neighborhood you come to church live and I'll give you a roll of toilet paper your house will be full and we'll get people saved on Sunday <laughs> I've done things out of fear I've done crazy things out of fear Things that cost me thousands of dollars. Not, you know, I mean, some people are buying toilet paper right now, and I don't even know what toilet paper cost, unfortunately, but, you know, maybe they spent hundreds of dollars on, on that because of fear. I've spent thousands of dollars because of fear. I got into martial arts because of fear. I used to have 35 guns because of fear. <laughs> I only kept the hunting ones pretty much, but you know what I'm saying? But you know, what will fear do to you? It will cause you to do all kinds of things that aren't directed by God. Amen. What areas of your life are you resisting what God's word says? Most people have a stronghold in their identity because they don't think they're beautiful, they don't think they're valuable, they don't think they're loved, and they don't think they're awesome. And therefore, they react in ways that are contrary to what God would want them to act. Nobody loves me. Lie. No. I know three people that love you very much. They happen to be God, who's the most important person in the world. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all love you very much. Guarantee you, guarantee you there's others that love you. Shoot, come to church, my dad will hug you, even though there's coronavirus. He'll tell you, he loves you. (laughs) We all feel unlovable, though, at times, don't we? You know why? Because we've walked away from God's commands at some point in our life, and we're not thinking the way that God wants us to think about ourselves. Strongholds. Casting down arguments. God says you're awesome, and you say you're not. An argument. God says he'll meet all your needs, but you're buying tons of toilet paper. You know, in reality, you, you just need to keep buying the way that you normally would. If you would buy a big pack of toilet paper normally, buy one. Just do what you normally do, and, and the supply chain will be okay. You know what I mean? But these people in fear kind of made it hard for people that weren't in fear. But that's okay, because God will supply. But do you see what I'm saying? And if you're one of those people that were in fear, like I said, I'm not condemning you. I've, I've spent thousands of dollars on fear, you know what I mean? And so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about my reaction was irrational because I didn't have God in that area of my life. You see, God will supply all my need. I don't know, he'll, he'll have somebody 
you know, you have a toilet paper truck break down in front of my house or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? Something can happen. There's all kinds of stories about supply, miraculous supply, not only in the Bible, but, but in history. Yeah. There's a man that ran an orphanage in uh, the early 1900s, I believe it was, and 1920s, something around those lines, and I, I'm getting the story a little bit mixed up, but anyway, it was early, you know, what I, in in it, you know what, actually, it might have been during the Depression, or during the World War One or two, I don't know, his kids were starving, they didn't have any food, he says, set the table, so they set the table, and then he goes, get the kids, and the, and the, and the, the people that helped, you know, were going like, we don't have any food, he says, get them, sit them down, we're gonna pray, God's supplying food, they're going, we don't have any food, and, but, and he's going, don't, get all the kids, sit them down, they sat down, no food, Bear plates, all this other kind of stuff. And they said, Lord, thank you for the food. And there was a knock on the door. And there was a knock on the door, and a milk wagon wheel came off. <laughs> and so they brought milk in for the kids. And then there was another knock on the door, and somebody brought in chicken. And there, you know, different things like this. And they had a full meal for the kids. Why? He believed God would supply. Now, what would have happened if he said, I'll believe it when I see it, the kids would have been hungry? What if he wouldn't have had the faith to have the kids sit down and to actually pray? God couldn't have orchestrated all that. But the wagon broke down, it's a coincidence. No, it's not. And God didn't break the wagon, it was gonna break anyway. God just made sure it did it right there. But maybe he did, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. How many things are we missing because we aren't bold enough to believe that God will supply all of our needs? You see, we get afraid to not be generous with people. In fact, you know what would be a really good thing? This is really cool. We're, Colleen and I are, are, are helping some people we know that don't have work right now and, and, and things like this. We're gonna have them work for us and help us, and so we're gonna be paying them and things like this. What if you found somebody that's not working right now, a waitress, a waiter, or something like that, invited them to church on Sunday, and you all take an offering and give it to them? Cool. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Why, you don't have to fear lack. We can be generous during the time that everybody else is in fear, right. because God will supply. Yeah. Amen? You getting anything out of this? Yeah. Give me a, I'm, I'm gonna look on Facebook right now. I wanna see a comment or something from somebody, you know, that this is okay. Give me a thumbs up or something. Awesome. <laughs> I got him on the front row right there. Awesome. Good deal. And Todd, I don't know how to see if they're doing anything or not. This is where I'm technically challenged a little bit. Although I see myself in the delay, like looking at my phone right now. I'm getting thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. So I want to look at this. Okay. Uh, again, this is, um, I forgot what, let me just read this to you. Well, okay, we talked about saying that God has not given us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Power to get things done, love because it casts out fear, and a sound mind. We don't have to react to what's happening in the world. We get to react according to what God's doing, not what the world's doing. Amen? We can think through these things with the power, with the grace, with the supply of God. Amen? So this is what Willie George said. This is, Colleen and I got started in children's church and we used to do this, this guy called Willie George and he, he did the best children's ministry in the world. He'd bust hundreds of kids in to minister to him and stuff. It was really cool. And this is one of his teachings. The Holy Ghost will take the chicken out of you. And that's literally what this is saying. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, fear won't be there. You get so filled with the Holy Spirit, come on, you will drive out fear and you're gonna have faith responses where other people are having fear responses. Yep. Amen. How do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, the first step is you get born again. The Bible says that whoever, the Bible says repent and turn to the Lord. Turn your back on living without God and repent means to, I'm gonna change the way I'm thinking about this. And I'm gonna to choose to make Jesus Christ Lord. And the Bible says in Romans 10 that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the first step. Lord means boss. 
means that, Lord Jesus, I'm going to live for you. It's a decision. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to walk in this and things like that. And that's the first thing. And you get born again and the Holy Spirit comes in you. Guess what? You've got now power, love, and a sound mind. Then there's a second thing that the Holy Spirit wants. He wants to, to ask him to empower you to live this life. So there's two different things. You get born again, you make a decision to live for God, he comes in, makes you brand new, seals your heart so it's never gonna get condemned again. He gives you life, no more sin. He doesn't forgive you sin. He literally wipes it out and you get clean and new and you're in the family of God. You're back in that garden relationship with him. But just like the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and empowered him to defeat the devil, he wants to come upon you. And this is called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to really teach on this right now, but this is the deal. Right where you're at, right there, right now, in your home, you can just do this. Say this with me. Holy Spirit, Spirit. fill fill me. Baptize me. I want every bit of you. Don't hold back. I want everything. So Holy Spirit, come. Now, some of you right now, you may have gotten filled with the Holy Spirit and start praying in tongues. Seriously, just like that. And you're going, what's going on? (laughs) That's the Holy Spirit flowing out of you a heavenly language that will defeat the devil. Amen. I ask every morning, pretty much every morning I wake up and go, Holy Spirit, fill me today. I need to be filled today to handle the challenges of this day. I need to be filled to be courageous this day. I can't do the will of Father without you. Fill me today. And there's times throughout the day I go, Holy Spirit, fill me. Just come upon me because I need your help. You haven't gotten a spirit of fear. You can get rid of it. Because now you have the spirit that makes you strong and courageous and is full of love and will give you the ability to think soundly. That's the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So let's not react in fear. And and when we're out, we're meeting people that are in fear. Can we bring them comfort and peace? Just let them know it's going to be okay. If they'll let you pray for them. If they'll let you lead them to Christ because then they'll get peace. And during times of fear, people are open to God. Amen? So just to kind of recap this, fear is separation from God. And if you have fear in any area, you've basically separated yourself from the counsel of God in that area. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. When I get born again, I get his spirit. But I can also be filled with his spirit, like he said, and he told them to wait in Jerusalem until you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they went out. God wants you to be filled. Why? We're gonna drive fear right out of our lives. Amen? Man, what a deal. Father, I just pray for everybody listening right now. And we bind fear We rebuke it. You will not have anybody watching this service right now. You will not have one of them. Father, I ask that by your spirit that you would just lead uh, and just fill the people that are watching this service right now. Drive out fear. Give us wisdom on how to respond to everything that's happening. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you got born again, if you asked Jesus into your heart, Maybe I didn't, you know, should we just pray that prayer right now? Maybe there's somebody that, that's there and you want to get born again. Let's do that right now. Just bow your heads. Everybody in, the, everybody in the house, everybody in the, you know, just for the sake of everybody that might be watching. You're there by yourself. It's okay. Excuse me. Let's just pray. Just say this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay the price for sin. I've sinned. I need to be released from it. it. And you said in your word, if I would call Jesus Lord, I would be saved. So Jesus, I choose you. 
I choose to live for you from this day forward. I give you my life. Thank you for receiving me. And I ask that you fill me with your spirit. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time, would you do this for me? Get your phone out. And I want you to text to 41411 these words, got saved, G-O-T-S-A-V-E-D. So it's 41411, the words got saved. That'll take you to a link where we're going to ask for your email address. I'll send you uh, a week's worth of teachings that will just describe to you what it is to have a relationship with a God you don't know, a God you can't see, and it'll just get you, on the, it'll get you started on the right path. And so let us know that you did that. I'm proud of you. Appreciate you. If you want to give and keep supporting the ministry, you know, you can do that online. And so we appreciate it, and we just appreciate all the faithfulness of everybody that's been giving while this has been going on. And it's allowing us to be able to help people that need help. I appreciate you guys. You're the best church in the whole world. I love you. Thank you. Be blessed.